Chemical kinetics is the branch of chemistry that studies how fast or slow a chemical reaction will happen and also explains what factors can affect the speed of the reaction. To understand it deeply, first, we need to learn what is meant by the rate of reaction. Actually, the rate of a reaction tells us how fast reactants are converted into products, or simply, we can say at what speed the reactants are changing into products. The rate of a chemical reaction can be measured as the change in concentration of reactants or products divided by the time taken for that change. It means that mathematically, the rate of reaction is equal to delta x divided by delta t. We need to remember that here delta x refers to the change in concentration of reactants or products, and delta t refers to the change in time. Keep in mind that from the formula of the rate of reaction, we can easily find out the units of the rate of reaction. Since concentration is expressed in moles per dm cube, and the unit of time taken for the change is seconds, it means that the units for the rate of a chemical reaction will be moles per dm cube per second. Now, let's move towards types of reaction rates. There are two main types to describe reaction rates, and they are the instantaneous rate and the average rate of reaction. First, let's understand the instantaneous rate of reaction. It can be defined as the rate of a chemical reaction at any specific time interval and is called the instantaneous rate of reaction. For example, in the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, the rate of reaction at any time interval will be its instantaneous rate of reaction. Now, let's move towards the average rate of reaction. It can be defined in such a way that if we take the average of the rate at any two specific time intervals, then it will be called the average rate of a chemical reaction. We need to keep in mind that in order to find out the average rate of reaction, first, we need to find out the instantaneous rate of reaction for at least two time intervals. And then we need to take the average of these two rates. And now, it will become the average rate of reaction. Now, it's time to move towards factors affecting reaction rate. Some important factors like concentration, temperature, surface area, and catalysts play an important role in the speed of a reaction. First, let's understand the effect of the concentration of reactants on the rate of reaction. Keep in mind that a higher concentration means more molecules are available to collide, and it means that the reaction will occur at a rapid speed. But if reactants are present in a lesser amount, then automatically the speed of the reaction will be slower. So, from this, we can say that the concentration of reactants is directly proportional to the speed of the reaction. For example, when magnesium reacts with hydrochloric acid, increasing the acid concentration makes hydrogen gas form more quickly. Now, moving towards temperature. Actually, increasing the temperature makes molecules move faster, which will result in more energetic collisions and a higher reaction rate. We can take a very common example to understand it. As we know, food spoils faster in summer than in winter. Actually, it happens because the higher temperature speeds up microbial activity. Activity. Now, we will move towards the effect of the surface area of reactants on the reaction rate. We need to understand that a smaller particle size means more surface area is exposed, which will allow more collisions and a faster reaction will take place. For example, powdered sugar burns faster than a sugar cube because more surface area is exposed to oxygen. Now, if we look at how the presence of a catalyst affects the rate of reaction, we need to remember that a catalyst speeds up a reaction by lowering the activation energy without being consumed. So, it means that the general use of a catalyst will help to increase the rate of a chemical reaction. For example, manganese dioxide speeds up the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, so we can say that the presence of a catalyst will help to speed up the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. Now we will understand what the basic concept of rate law and order of reaction is. First, let's understand the rate law. Actually, the rate law is a mathematical equation that shows how the speed of a chemical reaction depends on the concentration of the reactants. It also tells us how changing the amount of reactants affects the reaction rate. The rate law can be mathematically expressed in such a way that the rate is equal to K into the molar concentration of A raised to the power of M and the molar concentration of B raised to the power of N. Keep in mind that here A and B represent the molar concentration of reactants, K represents the rate constant, and here M and N refer to the reaction order, which tells us how much each reactant affects the rate. Now let's move towards the order of reaction. Actually, the order of reaction is defined as the sum of the exponents of reactants in the rate law expression. We can further divide the order of reaction into different types, such as zero order reaction, first order reaction, second order reaction, third order reaction, and pseudo first order reaction. First, let's start with the zero order reaction. It can be defined as those reactions which are independent of the initial concentration of reactants and are called zero order reactions. 
To understand it deeply, we can take a very common example of the photosynthesis process. In this case, we need to understand that actually the rate of reaction depends upon the intensity of sunlight, and it is independent of the amount of chlorophyll present. Now let's understand the first order reaction. Those reactions in which the sum of exponents raised to the concentration power in the rate law expression is equal to 1 will be called a first order reaction. We can take the example of radioactive decay because radioactive decay always follows first order kinetics. Now moving towards second order reactions. If the concentration of reactants raised to the concentration power in the rate law expression is equal to 2, then it will be called a second order reaction. For example, the reaction of nitrogen dioxide with itself to form NO and O2. Now moving towards the third order reaction. They are defined as those reactions whose concentration is raised to the power of 3 in the rate law expression. A common example of a third order reaction is the reaction between nitrogen dioxide and carbon and monoxide. Now moving towards the pseudo-first order reaction. It can be defined as a reaction that looks like a first order reaction but is actually of a higher order. This happens when one of the reactants is present in large excess, so its concentration remains almost constant during the reaction. A common example of a pseudo-first order reaction is the hydrolysis of ethyl acetate with water. Now we should move towards collision theory and activation energy. First, let's understand the concept of collision theory. According to this theory, during a chemical reaction, react must collide with each other in order to change into products. The collision theory says that it is necessary for all the reactants to collide with each other for them to convert into products. We need to remember that for a reaction to occur, molecules must collide with sufficient energy to break and form new bonds, and these reactants must have the correct orientation to lead to a reaction. Now moving towards activation energy. It can be defined as the minimum energy needed for a reaction to occur and is called activation energy. To understand it, let's have a look at this diagram. As we can see, there is a hill or top position that shows that if the colliding molecules cross this hill, they will be converted into products. And if they collide with each other but their energy is not enough to climb this barrier, then in this way, no product will be formed. So, in simple words, we can say that activation energy is the energy required for the reacting molecules to climb the hill and change into products. We need to remember that there is another important term in this case, which is called the activated complex. We can define the activated complex in such a way that an activated complex is a temporary, high-energy arrangement of atoms that forms during a chemical reaction. Actually, it's like a middle step between the reactants and the products. Now let's move towards the Arrhenius equation. Keep in mind that the Arrhenius equation shows how the reaction rate changes with temperature. The mathematical expression for the Arrhenius equation is K is equal to AE raised to the power of minus EA over RT. Remember that here K is the rate constant, A is the frequency factor, EA represents the activation energy, R stands for the gas constant, and T refers to the temperature on the Kelvin scale. This equation shows that as the temperature increases, E raised to the power of minus EA over RT will also increase and as a result, it will make the reaction faster. We can understand this with a common example that refrigerating food slows down spoilage because lower temperatures reduce reaction rates. Now, we should move towards catalysis. Actually, catalysis refers to the chemical process that takes place in the presence of a catalyst. And we should remember that a catalyst is a substance that speeds up a chemical reaction without being used up or changed permanently in the process. It helps the reaction to happen faster by lowering the energy needed for it to start. In simple words, we can say that the main function of a catalyst is to actually lower the energy barrier or hill by lowering the activation energy. And as a result, the reaction will proceed faster and the rate of reaction will automatically increase. Now let's discuss the types of catalysts. Actually, there are two types of catalysts, homogeneous catalysts and heterogeneous catalysts. First, let's start with homogeneous catalysts. Remember that if both the reactants and the catalyst are present in a single phase, which means that the physical state of both is the same, then such a catalyst will be called a homogeneous catalyst. A simple and common example of a homogeneous catalyst is sulfuric acid in the esterification reaction. In this reaction, sulfuric acid helps speed up the reaction between an alcohol and a carboxylic acid to form an ester and water, while remaining in the same liquid phase as the reactants. 
Now, moving towards heterogeneous catalysts. In this case, both reactants and the catalyst are present in different phases. A simple and common example of a heterogeneous catalyst is iron in the Haber process. In this reaction, iron acts as a solid catalyst to speed up the formation of ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen, while remaining in a different phase, which is solid, than the reactant which, which are present in the gaseous phase. Now let's discuss enzyme catalysis. Enzyme catalysis is a process in which enzymes, which are biological molecules, mostly proteins, speed up chemical reactions in living organisms. These enzymes act as natural catalysts and are highly specific, meaning each enzyme works on a particular substance called a substrate. The substrate binds to a special region of the enzyme called the active site, where the reaction takes place. This interaction lowers the energy needed for the reaction to occur, making it happen much faster than it would on its own. After the reaction, the enzyme remains unchanged and can be used repeatedly. One key feature of enzyme catalysis is its specificity. An enzyme will only catalyze one type of reaction. For example, the enzyme amylase helps break down starch into simple sugars, but it cannot break down proteins or fats. Another important concept is enzyme activity, which can be affected by factors like temperature, pH, and substrate concentration. If conditions are not suitable, the enzyme may lose its shape and stop working, a process known as denaturation. 